Welcome everyone to the beginning of my four part series on the Halloween franchise. I am stoked. I have wanted to review the entire Halloween franchise for so long <laughs> and it was originally actually going to be one of the first things that I did when I first started the podcast. I was actually going to take the entire Halloween franchise and do a review like I'm doing now. But there was just so many other amazing movies that I wanted to talk about and that I know you all wanted to hear about. So I kind of put that on the back burner a little bit. But it's October. And since it's October, <laughs> what better time to do an entire franchise review of the Halloween series? So this will be the first episode in a four-part series. Each episode will be released in the coming weeks throughout the month of October. This episode of the series, we're going to go over the first three entries of the Halloween franchise. Halloween 1978, Halloween 2, and even Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. And for the first time ever, I actually watched Halloween Season of the Witch. And if, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably know that I was less than thrilled for having to spend 92 minutes of my life watching Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. But I did it because if I'm going to talk about a movie on the podcast, I need to have watched it. <laughs> it's just that's how it flies. So I, I sat down, I watched the third Halloween movie, and overall was not impressed. But we're going to dive into that a little bit later in this episode. And there's going to be so much really to go through between some of the best and worst entries in this franchise. And I'm looking at Busta Rhymes and the Kung Fu ways. That's what I'm talking about here with that terrible entry. Oh my god. Thankfully though, <laughs> we still have a ways to go before we get into some of the worst entries of the Halloween franchise. We're starting off with the iconic film that not only kickstarted the franchise we know and love today, but it paved the way for so many iconic slasher films to come. John Carpenter's Halloween is often cited as the birth of the slasher movie, right? And funny enough though, not a single drop of blood is actually seen on film during Halloween, except for the death of Judith Myers. At the beginning of the film, when, when Michael goes in to uh, the house and he kills Judith Myers, that's the only time you somewhat see blood you hardly like you have to really be like focusing eagle-eyed on that scene to even notice that there's blood there but that is the only scene in halloween 1978 that has any blood in it and when you and when we really break down these movies it becomes clear that the sequels to follow gave us more of michael myers that truly cemented halloween as the iconic slasher that we know it is today and when halloween 1978 was even thought of john carpenter had just been fresh off the heels of his successful film assault on precinct 13 in 1976 during a viewing at the milan film festival erwin yoblins and a financer mustafa akkad had actually sought out carpenter to direct a new film this one, though, would take a completely different direction than his hit movie Assault on Precinct 13. And this film would be a psychotic killer who stalks babysitters. <laughs> and in an interview with Fangoria magazine, Erwin Yoblins was actually quoted as saying, I was thinking what would make sense in the horror genre, and what I wanted to do was make a picture that had the same impact as The Exorcist. Now, real quick, that's a very bold statement to make, <laughs> right? Like, if you've listened to previous episodes of the podcast, you may know that I consider The Exorcist to be the number one scariest movie of all time. Like, hands down, my scariest movie of all time, Exorcist. Nothing comes close to it. Halloween 1978 is not, in my opinion, terrifying. Like, it definitely builds suspense. It definitely strikes a chord with fear. Would I consider it an actual, like, scary, scary movie? Like, oh my god, I'm frightened? Not so much. Maybe in 1978, yeah. You know, maybe if I lived in the era of 1978 when this movie came out, I may actually have different feelings towards it. But in today's day and age, not so much. However, if you were to equate the impact that The Exorcist had on the horror genre and the possession subgenre as a whole, then I would agree. Because Halloween really cemented itself as the Mount Rushmore of slasher films, really. Like, when you think of your Mount Rushmore of slasher killers, Michael is there. Like, if he's not, why? <laughs> I need to know why. But I guarantee you, when you think of the slasher movies of, of our iconic heyday, Michael Myers is definitely on that Mount Rushmore for you. So the two wanted to get Carpenter on board to direct this movie about a psychotic killer who's chasing after babysitters. Carpenter agreed. He agreed to direct the film, though it was contingent on him having full creative control over the film. And in turn, <laughs> he would receive $10,000 for his contribution to the film. 
And that included writing, directing, and scoring the film. Let me, let me repeat that in case you didn't hear it. Car- John Carpenter got paid $10,000 for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> that's highway fucking robbery. Like, and I know that that was a big bone of contention for Carpenter in like s- sequels to come. We'll talk a little bit about it, but like he basically tried to make up for the money that he lost from the first Halloween by like charging triple and quadruple his rate for future Halloween installments, which all the power to him. He definitely deserves it. So Carpenter had agreed and he got his girlfriend at the time to work alongside him and his soon to be wife, Deborah Hill. They started working on the draft for the story of Halloween And it's said that Carpenter and Hill had taken inspiration from film director Bob Clark when John Carpenter had asked him what his ideas were for a sequel to the 1974 slasher film Black Christmas. And for those who haven't seen Black Christmas, it's about an unseen and motiveless killer who stalks and murders students residing in a university sorority house. Sound a little familiar? (laughs) Not exact ripoff, but, you know, similar concepts. And it took Carpenter and Hill about 10 days to finish completing the screenplay for Halloween. Yoblins and Akkad conceded to the two when it came to creative control. However, Yoblins did provide several suggestions on the original screenplay. Although not the kind of suggestions that were really appealing to either Carpenter or Hill. In an interview with Fangoria, Deborah Hill is quoted as saying that Yoblins wanted the script written like a radio show with booze every 10 minutes. Which would have been an absolute terrible decision, obviously. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, I'm all for radio style shows. Especially the ones done between the 50s and 70s era, like 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'm a huge fan of those radio shows. Especially the horror radio shows, you know, Vincent Price, Boris Karloff, all that kind of stuff. So could you imagine booze happening every 10 minutes during this movie? Like, there's a time and a place for that kind of thing. This platform was definitely not one of them. Like, a boo when Michael gets a kill? Like, if if that movie had actually been produced, I'd be surprised if it saw the light of day. That's how bad it would be. In the script for Halloween, it took three weeks to write, and a lot of the inspiration Carpenter and Hill took for the plot came from Celtic traditions of Halloween, specifically the festival Samhain, which sparks a subplot that we see later in the Halloween franchise. However, despite the inspirations Carpenter and Hill took from the Celtic tradition, Samhain isn't mentioned in the plot of the first film at all. It's not until the sequel, Halloween 2, that we get any sort of reference or mention of Sam Hain in any way. In an interview with Deborah Hill, she's quoted as saying, The idea was that you couldn't kill evil. And that was how we came about the story. We went back to the old idea of Sam Hain, that Halloween was the night where all the souls are let out to wreak havoc on the living. And then came up with the story about the most evil kid who ever lived. And when John came up with his fable of a town who has a dark secret of someone who once lived there, and now that evil's come back, that's what made Halloween work. They took kind of an an age-old setting of Halloween, right? Halloween was always known as the night the dead rise, you know, All Hallows' Eve, that kind of thing, right? So to take that concept and then put it in with something that is just pure evil and then creating a character from that is absolutely amazing, super iconic, and is really the recipe for success that made Halloween 1978 what it is today. And Deborah Hill had actually worked as a babysitter for the majority of her teenage years, which gave her tons of experience and background when she was writing the dialogue for the female characters of the film. Carpenter spent most of his time drafting the speeches that we hear through the film. So Loomis speaking on the emptiness and soulless of Michael Myers, that was really where Carpenter put his talents. And both of them took many of their own life experiences and backgrounds in general when they were developing the script. Like the fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois, was actually derived from Haddonfield, New Jersey, which is the hometown of Deborah Hill. Several other street names that we see through the film were actually taken from uh, Carpenter's hometown in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So they're paying homage to tons of different places and experiences that they've encountered while they were going on their journey in life. But not only that, they also paid homage to one of the greatest masters of horror, and that's Alfred Hitchcock. There's two characters in the Halloween 1978 film which have names that pay homage to Alfred Hitchcock. Tommy Doyle, he's actually named after Lieutenant Detective Thomas J. Doyle from the movie Rear Window, released in 1954. Which was a great movie, by the way. I don't think I've seen the original version of this movie, but I do remember seeing, I believe it was Christopher Reeves, who had played the role of the man who witnessed the murder. I I love that film. It was really suspenseful. But anyways, uh, Dr. Loomis's name was also a homage to Hitchcock. But anyways, Dr. Loomis's name was also a homage to Hitchcock. It was derived from the character Sam Loomis, who was the iconic slasher in Psycho. And ironically, Sam Loomis played the boyfriend of Marion Crane, who was played by Janet Leigh. 
Now, for those who don't know, Janet Lee is the real-life mother of Jamie Lee Curtis. So an amazing tie-in there between the cast while still paying homage to a horror icon. The financier of the film, Mustafa Akkad, he put up a total of $300,000 for the film's budget, which I know sounds like a lot of money, but at the time was actually pretty low for a film. So it was considered a low-budget film at the time, and it really inspired John Carpenter to get crafty by using items on hand or could be purchased inexpensively when it came to things like wardrobe and props that were used on set. Many of the actors wore their own clothes during the filming of the movie, and there was cast members that uniquely collaborated in helping move equipment and facilitating setups of the set as well. And in one of the most creative and inexpensive ways of creating a horror icon, <laughs> The iconic Michael Myers mask worn throughout the film, which many of you probably know, is a Captain Kirk mask. And it was only purchased for $1.98 at a costume shop on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> so imagine being the dude that sold that mask. I think it was Tommy Lee Wallace, actually, from the crew that went into that shop and bought the mask. Imagine being the dude that sold that and went, whoa, I just sold, like, the Michael Myers mask. And to make the Captain Kirk mask into what they wanted it to be for Michael, they widened the eye holes of the mask and then spray painted it a bluish white to get that iconic look that we know of Michael Myers today. So we definitely also need to talk a little bit about some of the behind the scenes aspects of Halloween because some of these numbers are crazy considering how much the movie's gone on to make. At the time, the only veteran actor who was involved in Halloween was Donald Pleasance. Everyone else was relatively unknown at the time, which really helped the low budget that Carpenter had available for the film. Originally, Carpenter wanted the role of Dr. Loomis to be played by Peter Cushing. However, the offer was rejected by his agent because the salary was too low. Christopher Lee was then approached to take on the role of Dr. Loomis, but he ended up turning it down as well. It's funny because later on, Christopher Lee has been quoted as saying that turning down Halloween was actually one of the biggest mistakes of his career. So Donald Pleasance, he was the highest paid actor amongst the crew, and he only made $20,000 for his role in Halloween. Jamie Lee Curtis, she made $8,000, and Nick Castle, who played Michael Myers in the film, received $25 a day. Low budget people, low budget people. Man, and this movie went on to make bank. Isn't that crazy? And another funny thing is, is that Jamie Lee Curtis wasn't the only actress, or the first actress, I should say, that Carpenter had in mind to play Laurie Strode. Originally, the role was meant for Annie Lockhart, but because of several other film and television commitments, she wasn't able to take the role. Then Deborah Hill finds out that Jamie Lee Curtis is the daughter of Janet Lee, and it was all over from there. She figured it would be great publicity for the film and pushed for Jamie Lee Curtis to get the role of Laurie Strode. And the role of Michael Myers, of course, went to Nick Castle, which is an absolute fan favorite. Every Michael Myers fan loves Nick Castle. And if you don't love Nick Castle, what is wrong with you? And Castle was actually a friend of John Carpenter's from the University of Southern California. He originally was on set to watch and learn from the people around him when Carpenter approached him and asked if he wanted to wear the mask and take shots. Throughout the film, Castle's directed by Carpenter to make the slightest movements that we know to make Michael Myers so iconic. So for an example, that bob kill, everyone knows the bob kill. <laughs> and if you don't know the bob kill, it's the scene in Halloween where Bob goes downstairs after having sex with his girlfriend upstairs, grabs a beer, Michael's behind him. Michael picks him up by the throat, slides him up the wall, takes a knife, and puts it right into his chest. And then he's there just hanging on the knife, which of course is physically impossible, I know. I know, can't hang him on the knife. I know it's physically impossible, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> but it's still my favorite kill. That kill right there is what I'm talking about. If you remember that kill, you'll also remember that Michael stands there and he does that slight head tilt, right? Where it's almost like he's like admiring his work. That's the kind of movements that Carpenter was directing Castle to take. And to me, those movements are what made the Michael Myers character. It wasn't enough for him to just be overbearing, to be physically imposing, or to be scary looking. It was about how he acted how he reacted to the murders, and how he reacted before the murders as well. Like, for him to be standing there and admiring his work, like his murders are a piece of art, that's fucking sick. That is sadistic. That is what we want in a killer. We want to know what they're feeling in that moment because it really helps us encapsulate what their motives are in general. So let's not waste any more time. Let's head into the first movie discussion of this episode and talk about Halloween 1978. Halloween night, a small American town, 
15 years ago. Michael? Halloween. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. I think he'll come back. Exploring uncharted territory. And totally charted. Just talk. <laughs> sure, sure. Mm -hmm. The only reason she babysits is to have a Halloween. The movie starts off on Halloween night in 1963 in the town of Haddonfield, Illinois. The camera slowly moves up a pathway towards a house and then begins to make its way to the back and inside. A young boy grabs a knife and puts on a clown mask before proceeding upstairs to his sister's bedroom. He opens her doors and proceeds to stab her brutally with a kitchen knife, then proceeds outside where the police arrive and take him away to a mental institution. So that's Michael Myers. We've just been introduced to Michael. He's a kid in a clown mask, and he just brutally stabbed his sister, Judith Myers, and now he's being taken away to a mental institution. So we fast forward 15 years later, and Michael Myers is locked up in Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Now his psychiatrist, whose name is Dr. Samuel Loomis, and his colleague Marion Chambers both arrive on October 30th, 1978 to Smith's Grove. Reason being, they're planning on escorting Michael to a court hearing where Loomis is hoping that the verdict will be Michael remains locked up for the rest of his life. He doesn't have to worry about it anymore. He'll be forever behind bars, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, during this transport, of course, <laughs> Michael escapes. He ends up stealing their car and then murders anyone who stands in their way. Makes his way back to Haddonfield, breaks into a hardware store, steals some knives, a rope, and a white expressionless mask. Then it's the next day, Halloween 1978, and we see a high school student named Lori Strode, who's dropping off a key at the long abandoned house where Michael Myers murdered his sister 15 years prior. The movie continues to show Lori's day, while we have Michael Myers looming in the shadows, stalking her throughout town. She ends up noticing him throughout the day and tries to bring her concerns up to her friends Annie Brackett and Linda Van Der Klock, but they completely dismiss it, and they don't see any evidence of some masked man stalking Lori. They try to go see where Lori saw him, he's not there, so they just think Lori's seeing things at this point. And then we see Dr. Loomis talking to the courts about how they're planning on proceeding with Michael. He totally sees the lack of urgency in them trying to catch him, so he decides he's going to make a trip over to Haddonfield and take matters into his own hands, find Michael himself. So when he arrives, he ends up heading to the cemetery where Michael's sister Judith Myers was buried, only to find that her tombstone is now missing. He then meets with Annie's father, Sheriff Lee Brackett, at the hardware store where Michael had just broken into. He tries to convince him that Michael's going to tear through everything in Haddonfield and go on a murderous rampage, though his concerns are completely brushed off by the sheriff. But the sheriff decides he's going to humor 
the good doctor a little bit. So they decide to visit the house where Michael murdered his sister. Loomis believes that that's probably where they're going to find him. However, they're unsuccessful. And Brackett's doubt, of course, begins to grow. He thinks Loomis is just a madman who's on a grudge. However, Brackett leaves to patrol the streets just to make sure everything's okay. Loomis waits in the Myers house, expecting Michael to be back at any moment. Lori Strode herself, we get to see that she's not out trick-or-treating, partying it up like all the other teenagers would on Halloween night. She's babysitting Tommy Doyle, while her friend Annie is across the street babysitting Lindsay Wallace. Michael Myers ends up getting his sights set on Annie and Lindsay Wallace. He begins following and spying on Annie while killing the dog that's at the house. Deborah Hill actually uh, made a comment on this scene that the dog at the Wallace's house actually died. She had mentioned that the reason Michael killed the dog in this movie was to show exactly how evil the character was at his core. Tommy Doyle looks out the window and he sees Michael across the street. So he goes over to Lori and tells her that the boogeyman's outside, but she doesn't believe him. Now, Annie across the street ends up wanting to have some uh, late night fun with her boyfriend, shall we say. So she ends up dropping off Lindsay over with Lori so she can pick up her boyfriend, Paul. But when she gets into her car, guess who's in the back seat? That's right, Michael Myers. <laughs> and he strangles her to death, then slits her throat in what I consider to be an epic kill. Lori's other friend, Linda, ends up showing at the Wallace house with her boyfriend, Bob. But at this point, Annie had already left and she's dead in her car. The two of them end up going upstairs, have sex. Bob goes downstairs, just like we were talking about, the infamous Bob kill. He grabs a beer, Michael Myers kills him in one of the most epic kill scenes ever in a Halloween movie. After killing Bob, Michael ends up posing as Bob. <laughs> he puts on a ghost costume, which is just basically a sheet with some eyes cut out of it, and then heads upstairs to the bedroom where Linda's there laying down naked. She begins to tease him, you know, thinking that it's Bob, and she gets no response. So she ends up saying, you know, fuck you, calls Lori to try to find out where Annie is because they're still at the Wallace's house and Annie hasn't shown up yet. And when she's on the phone with Lori, that's when Michael strikes. She begins to strangle Linda with the phone cord while Lori is listening to it on the other end terrifying right and the sounds that linda's making on the phone are almost like orgasms which is what i'm guessing what Lori strode was thinking she was hearing on the other end of the phone so she hangs up on linda right thinking the whole thing's a joke but she's still slightly suspicious outside loomis finds his car <laughs> he finds the car that michael had stolen off him so he knows at this point michael's in haddonfield so he starts walking around the streets trying to find him Lori heads towards the wallace house because she's gonna check on linda and she ends up finding her dead body on the bed underneath a tombstone of Michael Myers' sister, Judith. So that's where that missing tombstone went. Michael took it, and I guess he's trying to recreate some fucked up family fantasy. I don't know. But anyways, Lori ends up running down the hallway in, in sheer terror. Michael appears from the darkness and slashes her arm, which causes her to fall over the stairway banister. Though in badass Lori Strode style, despite how injured she was from that fall, she gets back up and books it back towards the Doyle house. So she's slamming on all the neighbors' doors, screaming, asking for help. Michael is right behind her, slowly making his way to her in one of the most intense scenes in the movie. This scene right here really built suspense for me because you're like, oh my God, someone let her in. Like, Michael's there. He is coming and he will kill you. We have seen him kill a dog. <laughs> he will kill you. <laughs> So as Michael's closing in behind her, Lori ends up throwing a pot at Tommy Doyle's window to wake him up and open the door because nobody's still letting her in. She makes her way inside, tells the children to hide, and she phones for help, only to realize that her phone is dead. So now Lori's taking a moment to breathe and kind of capture her thoughts because she has no idea what the fuck is going on right now. In that time, Michael sneaks into the house through a window and attacks her again. But she ends up stabbing him in the neck with a knitting needle. She was prepared this time. And this would kill any normal person, right? Like that attack would just be the end. But no, not for Michael Myers. So after putting the knitting needle in Michael's neck, Lori ends up making her way upstairs to check on the kids, make sure they're okay. Outside the house, we have Loomis and the sheriff continuing to search for Michael. All the while, Michael's still alive in the house. And he walks upstairs and forces Lori Strode to hide into a closet. And in another completely iconic scene, Michael Myers stabs his way through the closet where Lori Strode's hiding. And then he gets stabbed in the eye with a coat hanger, then stabbed in the chest with his own knife, which gives Lori a chance to get out of the closet. She grabs Tommy and Lindsay, runs down the street, calls the police from a neighbor's house. Though, of course, we know Michael ain't dead yet. <laughs> so he gets himself up. He slowly approaches Lori as she's gathering herself together. 
Loomis ends up hearing the kids screaming down the street and runs towards the house to investigate. When he gets there, he sees the fight ensuing between Michael and Lori. Lori ends up ripping Michael's mask off, and this distracts him for a moment as he rushes to put the mask back on, giving Loomis ample opportunity to fire six shots into Michael, which knocks him right off the balcony. Loomis walks over to the balcony, which of course should lay the body of Michael Myers, but nothing's on the ground. Michael had apparently vanished, which Loomis showed no surprise to as he stared off into the night. Michael can be heard breathing throughout the end credits over top the iconic score written by John Carpenter, which brings us to one of the most terrifying endings in horror. This movie cemented Michael Myers as a horror icon and spawned, what are we at, 14 movies, I think, with the, including the terrible, blasphemous, we will not even talk about Rob Zombie Halloweens. Um, I'm serious, guys, by the way. I should probably clarify that because I don't know if I did at the beginning of this episode, and I'm not going to check. <laughs> I am not going to be talking about the Rob Zombie Halloweens in any part of this podcast. The Rob Zombie Halloweens are considered blasphemous content. They are considered completely against the lore and the character of Michael Myers at the cabin. That's, that's what it's considered. And I will not be talking about Rob Zombie's Halloween at any point. There will never be an episode. There will never be a moment where I give his iteration of Michael Myers any platform will not happen. So I'm just letting you guys know that right now. (laughs) But hands down, like there's so many Halloween movies and this was the foundation. This was the beginning of Michael Myers. And no matter what timeline you start when it comes to Halloween, like at the end of the day, we all know, like the Halloween fans at least know, there's multiple timelines in the Halloween franchise. Like we can't argue that, you know, you have Halloween one and two, then you have Halloween one, two, four, five, and six. Then you have Halloween 1, 2, H2O, and Resurrection. Then you have Halloween 1, 2018, Kills, and Halloween Ends, right? Like, there's so many different timelines that you can watch and different ways to experience the story. But at the end of the day, the first Halloween movie is always the start. And it is always the foundation for every Halloween movie to come. Now that we finished going over the first Halloween movie, we're going to dive right into the sequel of Halloween 2, just like Halloween 2 did itself, because it starts right at the end of Halloween 1. <laughs> See what I did there? I know, I'm lame. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so Halloween 2, it hit theaters in 1981, and it was the directorial debut of Rick Rosenthal. And you'll notice by saying that, that this sequel wasn't directed by John Carpenter. However, he did co-write the screenplay of the sequel alongside his now wife, Deborah Hill. And the film sees Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Pleasance both reprise their roles respectively as Laurie Strode and Dr. Sam Loomis. Although despite the fact that Carpenter and Hill were at the helm when it came to writing the screenplay, they were extremely reluctant to do so. The first Halloween movie was not intended to turn into a franchise. Carpenter had felt that the story had already been told. There's nothing more to say about it. Leave it be. So he truly struggled with penning the script for Halloween 2 and finding a worthwhile story to tell. In previous interviews, he's actually claimed that he downed a six-pack of beer every night to try and find inspiration for the story. I feel you, Carpenter. I feel you. That twist ending that we get of uh, Laurie Strode turning out to be the sister of Michael Myers, this was actually an attempt by Carpenter to inject something surprising into the plot. In other interviews, Carpenter has actually called Halloween 2 an abomination. So Halloween 1978 was a box office smash, right? Like it made millions upon millions of dollars. It was a cult classic. Everybody was talking about it. So of course, the producer, Erwin Yoblins, he was eager to make a second film, right? <laughs> like he wanted to make more money. So Carpenter was approached about the project while he was in the middle of developing his cult classic from 1980, The Fog, which coincidentally enough also starred Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> and the original concept behind Halloween 2 was to set the film a few years after the events of the first Halloween film. The plan was actually to have Michael Myers track down Lori Strode to her new home in a high-rise apartment building. However, after discussions and script meetings, it was determined that the setting would continue to take place in Haddonfield, specifically the hospital. And in what is probably one of the most funniest statements in the horror genre, the sequel to Halloween was intended to conclude the story of Michael Myers and Laurie Strode. (laughs) Here we are 40 plus years later (laughs) and still telling the story of Michael Myers and Laurie Strode. How cool is that? And watching interviews of the crew from both installments, Halloween 1 and Halloween 2, no one was particularly excited to film a second Halloween movie. So it's not really a surprise that this was intended to be the end. 
However, like I said, we're now 40 years in and still going strong. Now, we know that Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis both reprised their roles for the sequel to Halloween. However, Nick Castle, who had donned the Michael Myers mask in the first Halloween film, wasn't coming back for Halloween 2. The role of Michael Myers was actually filled by a stunt performer named Dick Warlock, and he was listed as the shape in the end credits. The mask that they utilized for Michael Myers throughout the second film was the same one that was used by Nick Castle in the first Halloween movie, and the supporting cast was mostly unknown actors and actresses for the most part. Both Erwin Yoblins and Mustafa Akkad were also both heavily invested in the making of this sequel. They gave them a hell of a lot more money to make the second one. They got $2.5 million to make Halloween 2 compared to the $320,000 budget they had for Halloween 1. And they began filming Halloween 2 over a six-week period, which started on April 6, 1981 and ended on May 18, 1981. And it was mostly shot at the Morningside Hospital in Los Angeles, California, along with the Pasadena Community Hospital in Pasadena. Rosenthal was attempting to recreate elements and themes of the original film while still keeping the execution his own vision. For example, the title sequence of Halloween 2, it's zooming in on a jack-o'-lantern, which is very similar to the original film's title sequence. However, a human skull is revealed in the pumpkin for the second one. The first scene of the film in Halloween 2 is seen through a first-person perspective, similar to how Michael Myers entered his childhood home to murder Judith Myers and subsequent people in Haddonfield. Like, there was all these obvious attempts to reproduce those jump scares which were present in the first Halloween movie. However, they didn't film Myers on the periphery, which is how he appeared in many scenes in the first film. In the sequel, Myers is actually a central feature for the majority of the scenes. In the sequel, Myers is a central feature for the majority of the scenes, which is quite different than how we saw Michael in Halloween 1978. And like there was space between Halloween 1978 and Halloween 2, right? Like there was years before the sequel actually came out. So they were able to see Michael Myers become that cult classic slasher icon. So that's really why the producers wanted to capitalize on getting Michael on screen as much as possible, which is fair. We all wanted to see Michael. That's why Halloween 3 didn't do well. They didn't have Michael. So I get it. I get the change. Another thing that many fans would notice that's different between the sequel and its predecessor is the amount of gore and nudity that we see in Halloween 2, which apparently was not a decision made by Rosenthal, the director. He contests it was actually Carpenter who made the choice to add more gore into the film than the original. Carpenter, he's the one who had concerns that the film would come across as too lame by the slasher audience, so he asked to refilm several death scenes to incorporate more gore. Which kind of surprises me. Like, I don't know if it was just how the evolution of slasher movies were. Like, this came out after Friday the 13th, which of course was a lot more gory than Halloween. So I don't know if it was just the fact that the horror community wanted it. They wanted more gore. They wanted more violence. Because Carpenter didn't have that in the first Halloween. And look how good the first Halloween was and how successful it was without all that gore. So Carpenter saw the changing of times in the horror genre. He saw what was coming and what horror fans wanted, so he gave it to us without even having to be asked for it. Principal editing of the film was conducted by Mark Goldblatt, and not only that, but Carpenter had some words to say during the editing process. He realized that there was an unresolved plot hole present because there wasn't any indication as to how Michael Myers was able to track down Lori to the hospital. So Carpenter resolved this by shooting a sequence which featured a young boy walking on the street with a portable radio. The radio was playing a news broadcast regarding the murders that were happening in Haddonfield, and this of course included the whereabouts of Laurie Strode. The boy at the time accidentally bumps into Michael, resumes walking, which provides an explanation as to how Michael knew Laurie was at the hospital. Cop out, maybe, but it's an explanation as to how Michael knew that she was at the hospital. So they got all that squared away, ended up getting rights for the theatrical distribution of the film sold off to Universal Pictures, and the movie ended up getting released October 30th, 1981 on 1,211 screens in the U.S., on opening weekend, the film grossed a total of $7,446,508 and was number one at the box office. However, this paled in comparison to the $47 million that Halloween had grossed. That's a $40 million deficit. <laughs> That's a lot of money. But at the same time, it still did better than any other horror movie that was released in 1981. Internationally, Halloween 2 was released in Europe, though it was banned in West Germany and Iceland because of the graphic violence and nudity in the film. 
the 1986 home release of the movie also ended up getting banned in Norway. So Halloween 2 is a banned film in some places. <laughs> some. And the film starts right where the first one left off. So we're going to talk about Halloween 2 now. We're going to dive into the movie, talk about what it's about. And it's great because it starts really right where the first one left off. So if you're watching Halloween 2, you don't have to really remember much. It's just a continuation. It's like, it's literally a part two. I shot him six times. I shot him in the heart. He's not human. Universal Pictures presents Halloween 2. More of the night he came home. Who is it? There was nothing within him, neither conscience nor reason, that wasn't even remotely human. Is this some kind of a joke? I've been trick or treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. Janet, go tell Mr. Garrett we're having trouble with the phones. There is no place to hide. He will always find you. What's this? It's a Celtic word. It means the Lord of the Dead. October 31st, 1978, and Michael Myers was shot by Dr. Sam Loomis, fell off the balcony to what we assumed, you know, would be his ultimate demise. However, he survived the fall and then escaped into the night. So we see Michael wandering the alleyways of Haddonfield. He ends up stealing a kitchen knife from an elderly couple and uses it to kill a teenage girl next door. Meanwhile, we find that Laurie Strode's been taken to the Haddonfield Memorial Hospital after narrowly avoiding the events that occurred in the first film, and Loomis is still continuing his pursuit of Michael with Sheriff Brackett accompanying him. In all the chaos that's ensuing from the events of this Halloween night in 1978, Loomis ends up mistaking Ben Tramer in a costume as Michael, which results in Ben being hit by a police car and burned to death, which I thought was a great comment on society. And I, I feel like they did something very similar in Halloween Kills with the mob scene where, you know, evil dies tonight, evil dies tonight. It's the same idea where you're not thinking clearly, you're not thinking logically, you just want to get the situation resolved. And because of that now, Ben Tramer, an innocent child, died. On top of that, Sheriff Brackett then also learns that his daughter Annie was one of the victims of the massacre at the hands of Michael Myers. So he goes off in a rage, right? His daughter's dead. He blames Loomis for letting Michael go free and then abandons the search for him completely. This leaves Deputy Gary Hunt in his place to help Loomis find Michael. So Lori's at the hospital and she ends up meeting a paramedic named Jimmy who starts to crush on her. And then, of course, Michael bumps into the child who's playing the radio broadcast containing Lori Strode's location. So he begins to walk off try and find Laurie at the hospital and he gets there and ends up disabling all the vehicles and cutting the phone lines before he searches the halls of the hospital for Laurie. So Michael is set. Michael is like, I'm not fucking around this time. <laughs> you got away once. You're not getting away again. I'm going to disable all the cars. I'm going to cut all the phone lines. The only thing he didn't do is cut the power. <laughs> like in a later movie, he gets smarter. And we're going to talk about that on the next episode. But I would have gone for the power too, Mikey. <laughs> 
But when he gets there, he does kill a security guard, a doctor, several nurses. Lori is still in her hospital room and has no fucking clue what's going on. She's dreaming about some time that she had learned she was adopted. And then she remembers that she actually once visited a young Michael Myers at the sanitarium. Loomis then receives some information that Michael had broken into an elementary school earlier in that night. So he heads over, starts investigating. He discovers a clue that connects Michael to Sam Hain and the occult. This is the first reference that we get in the Halloween franchise of Sam Hain. And this same connection, this same clue, is also supposed to be an explanation as to why he's apparently indestructible. So during the course of this investigation, a colleague of Loomis's, Marion Chambers, ends up arriving at Haddonfield. People are pissed that Loomis is going fucking John Wayne on this, right? They're like, you're a psychiatrist, you're not a detective, you're not a soldier, you're like a 60-year-old doctor trying to find a serial killer. What are you doing? So Marion Chambers arrives, and the reason is because she's going to escort him back to Smith's Grove on orders of the governor and under enforcement of a U.S. Marshal. So he doesn't really have much of a choice at this point, does he? And while they're on their way back to Smith's Grove, Marion reveals a very important piece of information to Loomis that he had no idea about. He finds out that Lori is Michael's younger sister and that she was put up for adoption after the death of Michael's parents, the records being sealed to protect the privacy of the family. Ay, ay, ay. And that right there, <laughs> that I just need to take a minute. That plot hole right there, I know, continues to remain a bone of contention for so many horror fans because the moment they made Laurie Strode and Michael Myers' siblings, it took the victim out of Laurie Strode. It took that suspenseful feeling of, oh my God, Michael Myers killing someone can happen to anybody. It took that away and then went, oh, it's because they're related. So as long as my brother isn't a serial killer, I'll be fine. <laughs> like, that's pretty much what they did. That's pretty much what they did when they put Laurie Strode as the sister to Michael Myers. They took out that whole suspense and that fear of, oh my God, like any Michael Myers could kill me. With that feeling, you go out and you see Michael Myers. You're like, oh, you ain't my brother. <laughs> I ain't related to you. You ain't going to kill me. It takes that fear completely out of it. And that's what I hated. It's really the one plot point outside of the Curse of the Thorn, which next episode, guys, it's going to be fun. Oh, I'm going to burn the Curse of the Thorn. Outside of that, the whole Laurie Strode, Michael Myers being brother and sister, hated it. Hate that plot line. I'm so glad that the new trilogy, the Halloween 2018 Kills and Ends trilogy, has completely retconned that. And retcon so many other things that sucked with the franchise. Love it. I'm really happy about that. Anyways, back to the movie. So Loomis has realized Michael's now after Lori because of their sibling bond. He forces the U.S. Marshal at gunpoint to drive back to Haddonfield. We're then brought back to the hospital. Jill finds Lori, who has been wandering the halls of the hospital, only to be shortly killed by Michael Myers right after. He begins then stalking Lori throughout the halls of the hospital, of course. Lori ends up escaping to the parking lot, hides in a car, and then Jimmy arrives, the paramedic, and tries to drive the car to safety, only to pass out on the horn. The guy just passes out on the horn and alerts Michael. Now, Michael hears this, hears this loud horn. He's coming over. However, at the same time, Loomis, Marion, and the U.S. Marshal end up arriving at the hospital, so they save Lori. Loomis shoots Michael. He keeps going until he falls to the ground, and it looks like Michael's been killed. He was shot multiple times. Marion calls the police, and the marshal decides he's going to go check on Michael's pulse. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> but before doing so, Loomis warns him, right? He warns him to stay away because Loomis knows he ain't dead. But of course, doesn't listen. Michael reawakens, and he slits the U.S. Marshal's throat with a scalpel. What can you do? You can't help stupid. Loomis and Lori then go on the run together. They end up in an operating room where he hands the marshal's gun to Lori before he's then stabbed by Michael. Lori aims the gun at Michael, shoots right in between his eyes, and then he begins to stagger around the room trying to find where Loomis and Lori are. He can't see at this point. The room now starts to be filled with flammable gas because Loomis has now turned on some gas that's just chilling in the hospital room. Aye, aye, aye. Not a fan of this. We're going to talk a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about this after, but... So Loomis tells Lori to run before he ignites the gas. So Lori runs out. Loomis ignites the gas, causes an explosion, which kills both him and Michael. However, the explosion actually throws Loomis out of the room and knocks him unconscious. Laurie watches on as Michael's engulfed in flames and emerges from the fire before collapsing. The film ends with Laurie then being transferred to another hospital. We believe that Michael Myers is dead and that this has been the end of the Halloween franchise. Now, Halloween 2 is not, in my opinion, right? It's always, you know, the podcast episodes are always my opinion and everyone's always entitled to their own opinion. But Halloween 2 is, it's a good movie. I don't have any real hate 
towards it outside of it being the one that gave us the brother sister subplot but it's not a good sequel it's not a good it's not i wouldn't consider it one of the best horror movie sequels of all time i would consider it a good horror movie i wouldn't consider it a good sequel to halloween it's a very similar idea actually to what i was talking about in last week's episode where we were talking about grave encounters one and two and it's a very actual the two are very similar when i think about it because grave encounters and halloween 1978 were both low budget indie horror movies they didn't have any story that they were based off of they were original ideas and people loved both movies they both of them became cult classics at the same time, both of them got sequels because of their success and a much wider budget. Now, when you have made success as a low budget indie horror film to then go and have a Hollywood style feature film where you have millions of dollars in budget, you're not going to be able to recreate that same feeling you had in a low budget horror movie. It's fucking impossible because you don't have the low budget anymore. Like as soon as you start throwing more money at it, you have more options available to you. And it's like being in a kid in a candy store, right? Like imagine being a director, you get to put your vision to life the best way you can and you have so much money to do it. But the problem is, is because you have so much money to do it, it's hard to narrow down the right option for how to execute it. Because all you're thinking about is, okay, what can I get that's the absolute most amount of money? Because that's obviously going to be the best quality. Not always the case. Because I consider Halloween 1978 to be leaps and bounds above Halloween 2. Halloween 2, I, don't, I would never even put in the same case as fucking Halloween 1. Because Halloween 2 just felt like a money grab. It felt like a desperate attempt to recreate that low budget indie slasher feeling we had with Halloween and turn it into something that it wasn't, right? And at the same time, Carpenter and Hill didn't want another Halloween movie. They literally made the movie with the intention that it was only going to be one. We told our story, that was it. And now this isn't an argument like towards there shouldn't have been any Halloween movies. I'm very glad that we've gotten like 14 Halloween movies in the last 40 years. Don't get me wrong. I'm very happy about that. But the thing is, is that when you're, if you're going to do it, you need to execute it correctly. And I know a lot of people like Halloween too. I, I've had this debate with many people on social media uh, that love Halloween too. They consider it one of the best horror sequels and all the power to you. That, that's awesome. But when you really compare like if I were to look at popular horror movie sequels of that time. So if we were to look at Halloween 2, Friday the 13th Part 2, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and Child's Play 2. If we were to look at those four movies, out of all of them, I would say the worst one would be Halloween 2. Because it, for one, it didn't bring anything valuable into the franchise and it didn't expand in a way that was effective for fans. Like the only thing we got was, oh, Michael's doing this because Laurie's his sister. Okay, but why? Like, did she torment him as a kid? Like, was she a bully? Was he sexually abused? Like, why? Why just out of nowhere does this guy want to kill his entire bloodline, right? Like I get they, you know, they try to explain it with the Curse of the Thorn like four movies later, but at this time, it felt empty. It felt like a cop-out. And compared to Halloween 1, which didn't have any twists, it didn't need any twists, all it needed was suspense and the feeling of unknown, right? Because that's where a lot of our fear comes from. H.P. Lovecraft is a big advocate for this, that our biggest fears as humans is fear of the unknown. And with Halloween 1978, there was so much unknown. What are his motives? Who is he? Why is he doing this? How is he able to do this? Right? Like, how was he imprisoned pretty much his entire life in Smith's Grove Sanitarium, but he's able to drive a car, disable cars, and cut phone lines? Like, all of these questions were, were lead us to being like, oh my god, he's unstoppable. Like, how the fuck does he know all this? But the more information that you give the less impactful it's going to be because the, the, the audience needs to use their imagination in order to encapsulate the environment, put themselves in that situation, and then ultimately be scared, which is your goal of a horror movie. If you're putting together a horror movie, your goal is to scare the audience. And if you're not scaring the audience, you failed. And that's really where I feel Halloween 2 failed, is that it didn't give anyone that Halloween kind of closure. 
You know, like if you're coming in to see a sequel of a movie, you want some kind of closure from that first movie. I don't feel like we got it. I just, I don't feel like it was a good end. I don't like the whole idea of, you know, lighting the hospital on fire and then it blows up like this. There's so many things about that movie that could have been done better, but I can tell based on the fact that Carpenter and Hill wanted nothing to do with it, that it was just literally a situation of let's get it done. Let's get it over with. Let's put it out and be done with it. And it comes out. It really comes out in the execution of the film. It comes out in the direction, everything, the plot. That's why I don't consider Halloween 2 to be a good Halloween sequel. I'll consider it a good horror movie. Like, it's a movie I'll watch again. It's a movie that I've watched several times. It's just, in my opinion, not one of the best horror movie sequels out there. And for those who don't know, there's also actually a television cut of Halloween 2. And is actually considered an alternate version of Halloween 2. So this film aired on network television in the early 80s with the majority of the graphic violence and blood completely edited out and other minor scenes were added in and others removed. Screen Factory released the television cut of the film in their collector's edition Blu-ray set in 2012 and then again as a standalone DVD in 2014. So if you want to grab the Halloween 2 set, head over to Screen Factory and grab that. It's about 92 minutes long, which is one minute less than the uh, theatrical version of the film. And there's also so many edits to this film that it's ridiculous. So much so that it really feels like you're watching a different movie. For example, the murder of Dr. Mixter is presumed to still happen, though it remains off camera along with Janet's murder. Though there's also dialogue in the movie which indicates she may have gone home at the end of her shift instead of being murdered. And the scene where Michael is stalking Alice got the recut treatment simply to imply that Jimmy's discovery of Mrs. Alves dead and his subsequent slipping in the pool of blood was shortened completely. Jill's stabbing is much less graphic and a moan from the ground implies that she might have actually survived it. Also added are scenes of Michael cutting the power, which explains the dark setting through the later half of the film, like I was going to say. And there's also extra dialogue between Laurie and Jimmy, Laurie and Mrs. Alves, Janet and Karen, a whole bunch of different characters. But another notable difference is the killing of the marshal. In the theatrical version, his throat is slit. While in the TV version, it's softened. Michael grabs him and stabs him from behind with no details to how the knife entered or anything like that. And while the theatrical version ends with the deaths of Michael Myers and Dr. Loomis, and it totally leaves the audience in a gray area as to whether Jimmy survives, the television cut features an extended ending showing Jimmy alive with a bandaged head wound from his slit. Now, I can't believe that we're going to be moving into this. I'm uh, (laughs) a... I swore that I would never in my life watch Halloween 3 season of The Witch. (laughs) I've been a Halloween fan, guys, since I was probably 10 years old. I'm pretty sure when I was 10 years old was the first time I saw Halloween 1978. And since then, I was immediately hooked. I loved Halloween. I watched Halloween 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6. I didn't watch 3 because when my mom uh, let me watch it, she told me, Michael Myers isn't in this one. I don't think you're going to like it. And she was right. (laughs) She was right. So I never watched it. My whole adult life, I've watched all the Halloweens hundreds of times, never watched Season of the Witch. Why? Because Michael's not fucking in it. (laughs) But like I said, wanted to review this for you, wanted to talk about it, so I had to watch it, so I actually knew what the fuck I was talking about. So I actually watched it, watched Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. All I can think of is why I watched it. Why did they even... I, I asked myself while I was watching it, why did they make this movie? And like, what was their expected outcome? Because it was an absolute mess of a movie and I don't understand why it has any cult following. Like some movies, horror movies that I don't agree with, but they have some sort of cult following, I can understand. Maybe it's just really bad, it's good. Maybe it's just so fucked up, it's good. That kind of thing, right? But this... It, like, is it just that it's cool to like the worst movie of a franchise like, or because it's the bastard child of all the Halloween movies that people are drawn to it? Like, I don't know. But either way, it was not just a terrible entry into the Halloween franchise, but an all around terrible movie. <laughs> but I'll, there's one thing I'll give to them. I will give them that the practical effects were pretty well done. I did enjoy some of the more gruesome scenes and kills of the movie, but it just wasn't enough to make it something memorable for me in any way. And I'm not I'm not really too surprised right? Like that's why I went into it with super low expectations, especially knowing that Carpenter and Hill didn't really want to continue the story of Michael Myers throughout a franchise of movies. However, they did agree to be a part of Halloween 3 as producers with the condition that it wouldn't be a direct sequel to Halloween 2. So with Carpenter and Hill on the project, Yoblins and Akkad provided a total budget of $2.5 million for the film, so same as Halloween 2. The majority of filming took place in a small coastal town called Lolita in California. The Silver Shamrock Novelties Factory was a milk bottling plant in the same town. 
However, the special effects scenes which involved fire, smoke, and explosions, they were filmed at Post Studios. And the Quarter Mass book series that was written by Nigel Neal was something that John Carpenter had really admired. So he had actually recruited him to write the original screenplay for Halloween 3. However, he didn't want the script to include elements of horror just for the sake of horror. But at the same time, the owner of the film's distribution rights saw the screenplay, and he wasn't pleased with the lack of graphic violence and gore. So they made changes, right? They made the changes to incorporate more graphic violence and gore. A lot of the plot remained the same. It was just an addition of graphic violence. But this still displeased Nigel Neal, the screenplay writer, so much so that he requested his name be removed from the credits. Like, I don't blame the guy. <laughs> I wouldn't want my name on this piece of trash either. So at the end of the day, I can't blame him. Now, a guy that we were talking about earlier in this episode, the one who bought the Michael Myers mask, Tommy Lee Wallace, he was a huge part of the crew for Halloween 1978. He came in as the director for Halloween 3 and revised the script. And he got direction from Carpenter and Hill that the franchise was going to evolve into more of an anthology style of movies. So he set out to create a one-off story, which would allow for a new film to be released each year with some sort of focus on the Halloween season. Despite the fact that they were departing from the story developed from the first two Halloween films, Wallace still tried to keep a connection between all the films through stylistic themes. For example, when the film opens for Halloween 3, there's a jack-o'-lantern, similar to how the opening was for the first two films. However, this jack-o'-lantern is appearing digitally animated. There's also a scene in the film where a trailer for the original Halloween movie plays, which I found to be super weird. <laughs> like, how could you have the first movie of the franchise exist in that world, but as a film? It's like it was supposed to take place in some kind of alternate reality where Michael Myers is, as you and I know him, just a serial killer in the movies. I don't know. That kind of took me out of it. Like, I get them trying to be like, oh my god, Easter egg, look, Michael Myers, but like... It just didn't work. And I think a lot of people agreed because the movie was not received well by audiences and critics alike. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch opened in 1,297 theaters in the U.S. on October 22, 1982. And it earned a total of $6,333,259 during opening weekend and went on to gross a total of $14,400,000 in the United States and was also the worst performing Halloween film at that time. How it made over $14 million, I don't know. I'm actually surprised. And it's probably because people were going to it, expecting Michael, and walked out fucking duped. <laughs> like, like, I feel bad for anybody who paid money to go see it in a theater and then walked out and went, wow, where was Michael? Like, I, I truly feel bad. I was lucky enough to be born after and get the heads up that Michael ain't in this movie. Don't watch it if you don't want to watch, if you want to see something with Michael. So I was lucky. Everyone else... Not so much at the time. So that sucks. I hope you weren't one of them. Now, we're about to actually talk about the plot of this godforsaken movie now. So if you don't want to hear it, I understand if you end this episode. <laughs> but if you're sticking around, I super appreciate it. And I love you. Thank you. about Halloween. Halloween. The barriers will be down between the real and the unreal. And the dead might be looking in. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran wrecked. Halloween, the children. You happen to know anything about this Cochran? All I can tell you, mister, is watch out. Season He's watching you, friend, I guarantee you that. Drink or treat, drink or treat. Hey, Mr. Cochran, just what is the final process? Fellas, I was just kidding. Witchcraft. To us, it was a way of controlling our environment. Hey! Where are they taking you? 
They're taking her to the factory. I want a mask. Can I have a mask? Uh, uh, just what I had in mind for you, little buddy. Why, Congress? Why? Do I need a reason? I've got nothing here to indicate there was ever a body at all. Operator, this is an emergency. <laughs> I do love a good joke, and this is the best ever. A joke on the children. I'm glad you'll be able to watch it. You've got to believe me. They're going to kill us. All of us. Stop it! The world's going to change tonight, Doctor. Happy Halloween. Stop it! Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, the night no one comes home. So the film starts us off a week before Halloween, which is a complete departure, of course, from the previous films. We're in Northern California, and we see a man holding a jack-o'-lantern Halloween mask and also being pursued by a mysterious man in suit. He ends up collapsing outside of a shop and is then taken to a hospital where he's placed in the care of Dr. Daniel Chalice, and this guy is an alcoholic doctor with a strained relationship with his ex-wife and two children. While they have this man in the hospital being taken care of, he ends up claiming during his stay that they're all going to die. And he also then ends up getting murdered by a guy in a suit who then gets chased by this doctor. And then when the doctor finds him in his car, he ends up lighting himself on fire inside of his car. Yeah, totally random series of events. But I guess it is a way to build curiosity as to what the fuck is going on here. Okay. Okay. After the body of the man in the hospital is identified, we get to meet his daughter, Ellie, who talks with Daniel, the doctor, at a bar. She reveals to him that she's discovered suspicious events surrounding her father's death. This all surrounds the Silver Shamrock commercials and jingle that we see played throughout different scenes of the movie. So the two of them head out to the Silver Shamrock factory in Santa Mira, California to investigate. This is the location where the company's making Halloween masks that we keep seeing advertised throughout the film. So they check into a motel, and when they get there, they find out that the Silver Shamrock is the main source of prosperity for this town that they're in. And at the same time, we find out Ellie's father, who is now dead, also stayed at this same motel recently that they're staying at. So a lot of coincidences, but we still have no idea what the fuck is going on. And then another person staying at the motel finds a microchip that had been implanted on the back of a medallion, which is attached to these Halloween masks from the Silver Shamrock factory. This medallion ends up emitting a deadly energy beam into her mouth, and she begins to pick at it with a hairpin. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous, but this is really the only thing that I can say I somewhat enjoyed about Halloween 3. The practical effects were very well done. I truly enjoyed some of the body horror-esque scenes and the graphic violence in random places, but truly, that's the only good thing I can say about this movie. Shortly after that weird-ass energy beam burst the lady away, men in lab coats show up in a silver shamrock van and then take her body away. <laughs> that's not sus at all. Then the following morning, Daniel and Ellie go on a tour of the factory and end up finding her father's car being guarded by men in suits. She tries to get close to the car, but of course these men in suits stop her. So they end up fleeing, they call the cops, but then Daniel finds himself unable to reach anybody outside of the town. Ellie ends up also at the same time getting kidnapped and then taken to the factory where Daniel, of course, follows and gets captured by men in suits. It's at this time we get to find out kind of what the fuck is going on. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> it's revealed to us that the master plan was to plant microchips on each Halloween mask, which contains a fragment of a piece of Stonehenge. I'm just going to give you a moment to let that sink in. And in case you didn't hear me, <laughs> the plan was to plant microchips on each Halloween mask, which contains a fragment of a piece of Stonehenge. I don't know who the fuck writes this shit, but they did, and it saw the light of day. And then once someone watches these silver shamrock commercials we keep seeing in the film, then these microchips in the mask will activate and kill whoever's wearing them. It'll cause fatal brain damage with a side of swarming insects and snakes coming out of every orifice in your body. Sounds pretty terrifying, right? Like that's, that's pretty terrifying. It definitely could have been if it was executed effectively at all. So Daniel gets himself locked in a room after finding out this news and he gets one of these masks put on him. Of course, it's explained now that the intention is not just to kill everyone. Oh, no, 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 no. I know we just said that, you know, 
it kills the person that, that the, wears the mask. But no, I swear, that's not the intention now. The intention, get ready for it, is to resurrect ancient pagan rituals of sacrificing children during Samhain. Yup, so that's where it gets ridiculous. 